And then they go, I did it. They said, I know. So from age three, this is just, this is, just this is, this is my two, okay. my non quite two year old, okay. but my three and a half year old does these like big, big storm cloud kind of things. And then his teacher tells me that that's like about my like very small. Like that's like doing like the storm. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started with the Workforce Development Board meeting. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I know it's fun to be back in person and talking to people actually out of the Hollywood squares. Um, so hopefully we'll do more of these and we'll have more time to reconnect in person. Um, so good morning and welcome to the first in-person meeting of the New York City Workforce Development Board in more than three years. I'm Adria Powell and I am the board chair. So good to see so many of you in person. Um, Abby Jo Siegel is not going to be with us today. She was actually called for jury duty. So her civic responsibilities call. Literally um, today. <laughs> um, and, but she sends her regards to everybody, okay? So first, a couple of highlights related to the agenda for today. We're gonna hear an update on the trends in healthcare from Daniel Liss, who's the executive director of the New York Alliance for Careers in Healthcare. And from our member, Sandy Vito, the executive director of 1199 um, SEIU Training and Employment Funds. And then we will hear from several speakers about the city of New York's commitment to expanding apprenticeships, including the Mayor's Office of Talent and Workforce Development, Accenture, CareerWise New York, which is a nonprofit organization, as well as the New York City Public Schools, which is the newly rebranded New York City Department of Education. Next, I have a fun tidbit to remind everybody about, which is our annual disclosures are due. Friday is the deadline. Thank you for the folks who have completed it. I will say we still have 10 members who have not. Please, as soon as you can, complete those disclosures. There's actually a $250 fine if we don't complete it. And I've heard that they actually enforce that fine. So. Please do the disclosures. Um, next up, a couple of housekeeping items since we're back in person. I just want to make sure folks remember that uh, the state's open meetings law applies to the Workforce Development Board since we are considered a public body. And as a result, the public can attend these meetings and the meetings are held in person to facilitate that. The open meetings law was temporarily flexible during the worst part of the pandemic, which allowed for virtual meetings, but now requires that we have an in-person quorum in order to con uh, conduct business. We do have some board members as well as presenters who are remote today, and there are certain exceptions within the law to actually do that. Um, but by and large, we are really working to have these meetings be in person so that we can actually get through the business we have to do. Also note that today's meeting is going to be video recorded and then it'll be posted online, which is also a requirement of the law. Uh, and as a longstanding policy, we ask that um, 
only board members speak because we want to make sure that we have time for questions, discussion, or anything like that. Um, and we are starting a little bit late, so we're going to try to keep everything tight and have a, a good productive meeting. So now I'm going to turn to some recent, we're going to hear about some recent developments in the talent and workforce development in New York City. And I will turn it over to Chris, who is headed up front to give us this part of the presentation. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me online? Great. Um, I, I just have to underscore what Audrey has said that this this is our first in person meeting in almost three and a half years. Um, and I think we were fit previously in this building on the 11th floor for the last couple of meetings. So it really is kind of a, a momentous time to be back, be able to see you all. Um, you know, it's uh, Times have obviously changed, but it's great to be back and to see your faces and get to see you in person again. Um, I wanted to just briefly go through some updates in talent and workforce development, some things that some of you may be very familiar with, but we haven't met in a number of months. And so I wanted to walk you through some of these things. So next slide, please. Um, so I'm gonna cover these items, executive order 22, which was a, an executive order that the mayor issued that created our re-envisioned office, the mayor's office of talent and workforce development, which includes the workforce development board. Uh, we'll give you a brief update on the future of workers task force work. Uh, talk a little bit about the talent cabinet, reflect on the state of the city 2023, and talk a little bit about a program called New York Scion, which is a, a governor initiative to uh, increase resources to help connect people with disabilities to jobs. Next slide. And by the way, these are all good. This is a good preface for all the other stuff we're covering in this meeting. Um, so th the vision, and I think Abby has shared this with all of you, the vision that was laid out in executive order 22, again, by Mayor Adams last year, uh, included sort of broad citywide objectives for talent and workforce development. So to sort of paraphrase that all young people launch successfully by the age of 25, Every New Yorker has the access to a living wage job. Employers benefit from having access to local talent that is qualified to meet uh, the roles that they need them to play. Uh, inequities, we, you know, we reduce inequities uh, and public and private resources are a lot more aligned and efficiently leveraged together. So again, long-term broad vision of, of workforce development. Next slide, please. And so part of the reimagining of the workforce system has to do with, um, you know, shifting, shifting from our current state of silos and islands and moving to a more uh, coordinated true system. And that's a big part of what our office has been tasked to do in partnership with the board in partnership with community-based organizations and lots of external stakeholders. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to give a brief update on the future of workers task force. I think we had originally billed this meeting as being, you know, we were gonna present the recommendations. The report is not quite done yet. Um, <laughs> we're still refining it. It's very close, but it is not yet ready for publication. And you know how these things can go. So, um, but the, the task force was comprised of a group of several dozen external folks uh, external to the city, that is, businesses, nonprofits, labor, funders, advocates, and others. And I think we had, I think Audrey said we had seven workforce development members represented on the task force, which was terrific. So what I'm going to go through now is these are sort of the five broad areas of recommendation, and hopefully we will be able to release the report soon, and then we want to give the board a full briefing on that. Because, in part, you know, one of the main tenants is reimagine the role of the workforce development board. Um, and those of you who've been around for years, we've we've talked about this for years, empowering the board, giving the board uh, more say, more ability to make decisions and really set the, the strategy and the vision for the city. And so that's definitely uh, a major part of what the, this task force talked about. Another area is to expand and support apprenticeships. 
Um, we're going to spend it. We're going to sort of do a deep dive on apprenticeships later. You're going to hear uh, a little bit about a model that New York City Public Schools has launched. It, by the way, it's no longer DOE. It's no longer Department of Ed. We call them NYC Public Schools now. That's that's the new thing. I think it's it's it feels less bureaucratic. It's a it's a friendlier name. But that's I will not say DOE anymore. It's <laughs> verboten. Um, and then another area is to align public and private investments. I mentioned this before, right? How do we really make sure that that various you know private foundations invest a ton of money in workforce every year, but it's been hard to sort of align the cities and and the private funders' uh, investments. Establish shared impact metrics. This is a recurring theme in workforce development. Um, we're finally going to do something about it, and then finally build an employer-facing front door. So we already have a talent portal that we're developing for job seekers, and there's sort of an early version of this that's out in the world, but we also wanna make sure it's really easy for employers to come to the city if they have any kind of talent-related need, an intern, an apprentice, a full-time worker, training for incumbent workers, and make it really easy for them to get connected to the services that they need. So that's the Future Workers Task Force. The five key areas, again, we will provide a full briefing once that report comes out to all of you. Uh, I'm trying to click as if I could move this. Jason, next slide, please. Um, a couple more uh, remarks. So the talent cabinet. Now, this was, this was uh, you know, created in Mayor Adams' Executive Order 22. And the idea behind the talent cabinet is let's create a formal body where city agencies and mayoral offices can come together and be really intentional about coordinating and building the system that we've been envisioning for a long time, but I think especially through the Future Workers Task Force. Um, it's comprised of 50 different city agencies or mayoral offices. Um, many run workforce programs. Some hire lots of people through contractors. Um, it's been convening monthly, I think, since October and November. So it's meeting very regularly. It's going to build on the Future Workers Task Force, right? We're not trying to recreate the wheel or start from scratch. We want to build on the Future Workers Task Force and make sure that the city is responding to that and in, in effect, like implementing the, the sort of vision and strategic framework that's being set by the, uh, the task force. Uh, and then finally, it's, it's an action-oriented group. It's really building an action plan to build a, a true talent workforce development system. And so I'm sure we will, at a future meeting, have more of an update. Um, one of the deliverables is to create an annual talent plan, provide that to the mayor. So I'm sure we will come back and provide more detail. Next slide, please. Um, I want to go through this quickly. Uh, I mean, the, the mayor's state of the city happened in Jan January? February of 2023, right? So it's been a few months, but Notably, there were, you know, there were workforce was was front and center. Jobs was really the first sort of content area the mayor talked about in his speech. And there were there are five initiatives that our <laughs> office, the newly expanded mayor's office of talent and workforce development, um, touches directly. So the apprenticeship accelerator, right? The mayor set this moonshot goal of having 30,000 New Yorkers in apprenticeships by the year 2030. Um, we're going to be a big part of that. CUNY 2X Tech. Very, very successful program. Um, Jason, would you mind trying to hide that? Did I do that? Oh, that's me. That's all me. Um, <laughs> sorry. See, we're, we're getting used to the hybrid meeting. It's it's very, it's still new. I, you know, I still like failed to unmute myself three times a day anyway. So what's the difference? But QD2X Tech is, it's a successful program to help prepare CUNY students um, for tech careers, and it's expanding to two additional CUNY campuses. The Nursing Education Initiative, we're going to hear uh, very shortly about the nursing shortage and some of the related healthcare trends in New York City, but the mayor announced a, a partnership with CUNY to support 30,000 nurses over, over five years because the shortage is so dire. We all, the mayor also announced the Center for Workplace Accessibility and Inclusion. We may have talked about that a little yeah. bit in the past meeting, but that is meant to help People with disabilities access more employment opportunities, and our office will be leading that. And then finally, community hiring. Um, we've talked about it in past meetings. Basically, if we want to leverage the city's enormous purchasing power, we need to pass a state law that allows us to require contractors to, say, hire a certain percentage of people from high-poverty zip codes. And so the, the mayor announced that in the state of the city, and we're 
the city is advocating for that in Albany as we speak. It was in the governor's budget proposal, but then pulled out in the, what are they called? One house memos or whatever. So it's still, uh, we're still trying. I think this is the third or fourth year we've been trying. So anyway, all good news though, uh, because workforce has been really front and center in this administration. Next slide, please. All right, finally, and I think I'm already over time, um, but New York Scion, it's, it's this governor's initiative to increase employment for people with disabilities. And Governor Hochul has been very supportive. Um, the goal is to make the, what are called the American Job Centers, what we call the Workforce One Career Centers, uh, all across the state more accessible to people with disabilities, more inclusive of them to help more get access to job opportunities. So New York City, we're getting $500,000 a year. It was just announced that that will be for up to five years. Originally it was for three years. So the, the governor has extended that, which is terrific. And by the way, other other local areas only get 100,000. So, you know, we're, we're uh, way ahead of the rest because we're New York City. Um, so we're gonna hire staff. And I think you'll hear a little bit more about that program when we hear from uh, our colleague Janine from SBS. Okay. So I'm going to turn it back to Audrea. Thank you, Chris. Um, now I'm really excited to present a new segment in our meetings, and that is industry updates. As many of you are aware, Chris was also talking about Executive Order 22 that was issued last year, um, actually consolidated the former Mayor's Office of Workforce Development and SBS Industry Partnerships. SBS Industry Partnerships were small teams of uh, sector ex experts who would identify staffing pain points among employers and then devise creative human capital solutions to address those challenges, usually in the form of job training. So now today we're gonna to actually talk about, uh, Chris referenced it in uh, the notes from the mayor about needing 30,000 nurses over the next five years because of a critical nursing shortage. So we're gonna focus on the healthcare industry and that shortage. Um, we will hear from the executive director of NIACH, Daniel, Daniel, um, and Sandy Vito, the executive director for 1199 SEIU training and employment um, funds. And their bios are on page four of your board packets. And so I will quickly turn it over to Daniel and Sandy. Sandy's on the screen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, so I am delighted to be here with all of you today as Audrey and Turn the mic is not on. Oh, there we go. Let's try again. Good morning, everyone. I am delighted to be here with you. Um, as Audrey mentioned, my name is Daniel Liss. I'm the executive director of the New York Alliance for Careers in Healthcare, which is the healthcare industry partnership now with the Mayor's Office of Talent and Workforce Development. I'm joined by my friend and colleague, Sandy Fido, um, who is not able to be in, here in person. She is on, on the screen. Um, and so uh, I am super excited to be here with all of you, um, both to talk about the healthcare industry and also because um, I've had the chance to talk with many of you over the past few years as we've been trying to, to deal with, with the emergency that has been um, the, the life that we've been living. Um, so a few sort of broad strokes comments about the healthcare industry, and then I'm going to turn turn it over to Sandy, and then we'll have probably a, a minute or two for Q&A, um, understanding that we are short on, on time. And apparently, I'm being told I need to have the mic even closer to my face. Is this better? Great. Um, so uh, first off, you can't talk about the healthcare industry um, and the healthcare workforce without starting uh, with the immense strain that people have been under um, over the past three years. Um, being on the front line in whatever way, whether that was directly caring for patients or whether that was sort of on the back end in healthcare, it has been enormously challenging um, for people in, in the sector. And it was really no understatement to say that the workforce is in a state of despair. Um, and this is a, a um, really a self-reinforcing cycle at this point where the more strain we have on people, the more people burn out and leave the workforce, the more the people who are left have strain and it sort of continues and continues. Um, in certain occupations, the cycle has been made even worse by a reliance on contractor temp labor um, in places where employers felt they really had no choice um, but to employ these, these sort of temporary staff in order to care for their patients. 
um, especially as we saw sort of surges in infection or people rushing back um, to get care that they hadn't been getting and they were staying out of, of the hospital or, or um, community clinic setting. Um, and uh, we are now at a point where we have really serious labor shortages in, I mean, titles we cannot do without as a city, right? So whether that is um, something like nursing, the entire nursing pipeline, uh, nurse assistants, licensed practical nurses, registered nurses, even up to nurse practitioners, as well as some of these um, more middle uh, um, educational attainment kind of jobs like um, respiratory therapy or central sterile processing, um, uh, rad tech, surgical tech, lab technician, technologists kind of jobs. And then even in jobs that require, uh, um, that are sort of at the end of an educational pipeline, like physical therapist or occupational therapist, nurse practitioner, physician assistant, um, doctor pharmacy. I mean, these are jobs that we are desperate to have more workers in, and we as a city just cannot afford to not have enough of. Um, and I will also say that as a result of all of this, while healthcare employers are desperate for some of these workers, all of the strain means that in the financial circumstances of, of running a healthcare business right now means that they have limited capacity to engage with the talent development ecosystem, right? And so um, we are finding that uh, it is really an uphill battle to, to grab some attention um, in order to work on exactly these problems that they are so desperate to solve. Um, switching gears slightly, the pandemic also put a renewed focus on equity. That's both in terms of equity for patient outcomes, for the health of our communities, as well as for businesses and workers in some respects. Um, that said, a lot of this health equity work um, has slowed down because we are too strained in the people that would actually do the work, right? Um, I, I will also say that we have uh, um, still, uh, some real equity issues across subsectors in healthcare, right? So healthcare is not a monolith. It's about a fifth of the economy. Um, about 750,000 people work in, in our healthcare sector here in New York City. And um, we have places like in home care where, and I, I know Audrey as our, as our board chair has talked about this um, uh, many times over the years, um, where while we continue to have a labor shortage, this has much more to do with things like wages or the structure of the of the business um, or how much revenue can come into to our home care businesses than it does with training, right? So training is a thing that we should focus on, but it's not like we can do a training intervention and fix a labor shortage in home care. Um, we also have uh, home care workers continue to not get sort of recognition even as healthcare workers, which is a problem early in the pandemic and, and still continues to be a problem. And this is also an issue that is increasingly true in nursing homes who were really scapegoated during the pandemic as a place and nursing home workers in particular, um, a reason why some things were going going wrong in our society when in fact it was not the, the workers at all, right? Um, so, a lot of that is about the pandemic and about sort of the impact of the past few years. Uh, there are also some underlying trends that have been true for a long time and continue to be true. And we continue to ask our healthcare system to change. Um, this, these are things like we have an aging population with people living longer with chronic health conditions that otherwise they uh, um, might not have been. And that's great, but it also requires more health services. Um, we also have trends in new financial models and um, workflows. Great, uh, thank you for joining. <laughs> um, so uh, things like, like new financial models and technologies and workflows and ways that we need our healthcare workers to work with each other differently and to work across organizational boundaries differently. And all of that requires new skills, new competencies, new behaviors. Um, and we're asking them to take on this burden while they are also just trying to do the, 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 the regular job of caring for patients in the way they, they always have. Um, uh, forever we've seen increasing uh, need for mental health services. That's not new, but it is of course much more dramatic um, and in the public eye in a way that it hadn't been for a while. Um, and that's both in terms of providing mental health services directly, as well as training our healthcare workforce to deal with a population that may have mental health needs, right? So even if you yourself are not a social worker or a mental health counselor, you might still have to work with someone um, who is struggling with mental health issues. 
Um, on the bright side, we are also seeing a trend in trying to connect um, uh, social needs and social services to healthcare, and an understanding that that social stuff has an impact on people's health. And is there a way that we can hook social services into the healthcare dollar to be seen if we will be successful? But it continues to be a, a sort of priority and, and and trend in the sector. And um, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm now going to repeat myself, which is all of this is um, a lot shall we say, for members of our healthcare workforce and for leaders in, in the healthcare sector to try and respond to the current moment and to adapt to where they think they need to go um, in the future. I'm going to actually uh, pause here and, and hand it off to Sandy, um, both to, to correct anything I said that was strange or add anything she feels she needs to, and also to talk about the current state of the New York State budget, um, because she knows that in much more detail than I do um, and can, can share with the group. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're all well. Uh, let me first start. Excuse me. <clears throat> let me first start by introducing Daniel Bustillo, who is the deputy executive director. He's about three months into the job uh, for 1199 Training and Employment Funds. He he is fresh off of uh, his role as the executive director of the Health Care Advancement Project, which is a national. Labor Management Training Partnership. So we're well, we're really excited to have him back with us. And I will share with you uh, that his expertise in workforce development uh, is fairly broad and deep, but also includes apprenticeships. So as you look at the apprenticeship worker, I hope we'll loop him into some of that work. Let me just take <clears throat> finish, you know, some of the things that Daniel List was saying, then I'll talk a little bit about the budget. Um, I, I want to frame the problem. Daniel List got, you know, really got the all the things right. So I'm not going to, I don't really have anything to add in. I'm just going to give a, a higher level frame. And I would say we have in healthcare industry two very significant e equity issues that are driving the shortages. The first is uh, what we call occupational segregation. It's a term actually used in, in multiple industries, but is fairly writ large in healthcare. So what do we mean by occupational segregation? We have the professional te technical jobs where there are shortages, nursing, respiratory therapy, some of the occupations that Daniel imaging, uh, nurse practitioner, um, some of the, thing, the occupations that Daniel mentioned. So in that case, and I'm going to get back to this, we have a fairly significant challenge around education equity. So let me come back to that. The second piece of occupational segregation relates to the fact that our economy has funneled women and women in, of color and poor women and immigrants into low wage jobs and the remuneration for those jobs, the job quality, both in terms of compensation and other factors is, uh, is bad, it's not good. So when we think about home care, and I know our chair, Audrey can talk eloquently about this, this is historically an undervalued occupation. And although there are of course education issues as, as, as uh, Daniel mentioned, education is not the primary driver of the workforce shortages, it's the quality of the job. And that is increasingly becoming true in our nursing home world. Um, we just met recently and uh, some of our employers and our union noted that the differential between a minimum wage job and a certified nurse assistant used to be about four times, you know, four, 400%. It is now only dollars. So if the minimum wage is 15, um, entry level certified nursing home workers are only making 18 19 dollars to start so that's a fairly significant um, diminishment of the quality of some of those jobs in the nursing homes so uh, we we as workforce development um, entities were often focused on education but there is a broader set of issues around job quality i think is is front and center and of focus to us so that's the first thing. The second piece that I want to note and get back to is the education equity issue. Just at a time of these decreasing 
shortages, we are also seeing a decline in enrollment. And there are lots of different theories about why we're seeing a decline in education enrollment. People are tired. Um, people are juggling too many things. Uh, the pandemic has really st uh, stymied the ability to get childcare for work, let alone for um, for while while one is in school. So there are big issues to address in our education system. And like many industries, healthcare is a very credentialed industry at the higher wages. What the world calls middle skills, we like to think of them as middle wage or um, family sustaining, life sustaining wage jobs. And those are at the professional and technical level and tend to be two year degrees as, as entry level points. So those are my points and I know you'll have you may have questions for Daniel and I. Let me just go to the budget. So the big budget piece right now for healthcare. <clears throat> I'm gonna. There's four issues. One is uh, the 11.99 is and employers in the hospital sector are asking for a dedicated funding stream for safety net hospitals. So as I think many of you know, let's start with the obvious. There were raises given to workers, hardworking healthcare workers who deserved raises, right? So 7%, 6%, 5%. So that's the three upcoming increases, not just for nurses, but for home healthcare workers. In the home care sector, there was a raise given of $1 last year, $1 next year. Again, insufficient, but still a raise. Sorry, Sandy, the, two years. Two dollars in October of 2022. Oh, two dollars. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right. So two dollars and one dollar. So three dollars total. Sorry about that. Um, and then so just back to the safety net hospitals because of their reliance on Medicaid funding for reimbursement, their ability to afford the raise is stretched. These are hospitals that serve the poorest communities in New York City and throughout New York State. So the dedicated funding stream for those safety net hospitals is one request that's on the table. The second is what we are euphemistically calling cut the Medicaid gap. So Audrey could tell you um, there were these increases given and then there were proposed cuts in different sectors throughout healthcare, which means the raises to uh, home health aides, for instance, are in peril because if there's not enough money to pay for the raises through the Medicaid uh, rates, then we won't, you know, there won't be um, the, the raise. The other things will get cut even if you're paying that level of salary. And then second is actually a, a, a request to increase Medicaid rates by 10% across the board. And then finally, there is a proposal to repeal what's called 340B. Uh, and this is related to the hospitals. We, we want to stop the repeal. You know, so there's a lot of controversy around the stop the repeal of 340B. That repeal would cut hospital prescription drug be benefit reimbursements. So there's uh, a request to pull back that repeal to keep the the hospital reimbursements for prescription drugs. So those are the big issues. Audrey, I don't know if you want to add anything that's home care specific. I think the big issue is increasing the Medicaid rates. Yeah, I'm yes, I the only thing I would add is that those increases are required by law. And because we work in the Medicaid space, we receive reimbursement through the Medicaid funded programs and they flow through the managed long term care insurance companies and the managed long term care insurance companies are not forced to pass on the money that the state has given them for those wage increases. So currently what we are experiencing are underfunded rates for those increases and the insurance companies being able to draw upwards of $700 million out of the system that's intended to go for raises for the home care workforce. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and, and Turn it back to yeah. Chris or who? Um, Chris, I don't know where we are in time. Do we have a time for a question or two? So we will do That's five minutes for questions if folks have any questions. One question, Audrey, is. Oh, 
How do we force the insurance companies to do the right thing? So I appreciate you asking that, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, currently, what a, a large broad swath of stakeholders are doing is actually trying to get leg legislation that is really around transparency and accountability in terms of building the rates, the reimbursement rates, and having a mechanism where it will ensure that those the rates that it what it costs to deliver the services is captured and then passed through to the home care um, agencies from the managed long-term care plans. Um, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but that's you know the the policy work is being done to really try to um, ensure that the Department of Health is building the rates and taking into account the different um, aspects of what it costs to deliver the services and then having a mechanism to see if the plans are passing along those rates and if they're not then there's there will be mechanisms to explain why they're not doing that. Um, uh, one thing I might I might add here is as much as we talk about healthcare as a market in many respects it it, it is largely not a market and doesn't really behave like a market. It is a highly regulated, like very tightly controlled system. And that is exactly why we have a situation where in order to increase wages, you have to have legislation. And in order to make sure it passes through, you have to have legislation. Um, and we're not gonna sort of snap our fingers and make it suddenly demand for services is the thing that, uh, um, and, and demand for workers is the thing that pushes up wages. Um, any other questions? Okay, so then I think we'll um, close that there and hand it back to the rest of your agenda and um, uh, always happy to come back and, and chat more with, with you either as a group or individually. So thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Sandy. And welcome to Daniel Bustello. <laughs> um, okay, so now we're gonna move on and we will hear a brief update on the adult WIOA programs from Janine Jones. <laughs> Hi, good morning, everyone. Is that working? Uh, <laughs> all right, so good morning. My name is Janine jones Sa. For those of you that don't know me, I'm currently the Assistant Commissioner of SBS on the Workforce um, Division. Um, I've been with the agency for about 10, 11 years now, which is crazy to me. Um, I first started off on the vendor side, then worked my way into operations, had the opportunity work um, to work within center-based programming, um, which was really the development and implementation of uh, programs for both the general as well as targeted populations. And I currently sit in the role as the AC here. Um, so I'm here to talk to you a little bit more about SkyOn, which is what Chris mentioned. Um, and that really stands for the New York Systems Change and Inclusive Opportunities Network. I will say we're, we are at the very beginning stages of this, the, um, the pilot that we're going to be doing. So I hope for this to be really just be a level set and we'll have many, many more conversations in terms of lessons learned and what we're doing within the workforce system in general. Um, but again, just wanted to give a high level update in terms of where we are now and to allow for any questions that you might have. Um, but the real mission of the SkyOn program is to really improve the participation of individuals um, with disabilities, including individuals with intellectual and development developmental disabilities. Um, more importantly, we really want to try to improve the outcomes of individuals. Um, there are going to be very, th um, four very specific goals that we work on during this process. Um, so again, improve that employment outcomes for individuals, expand available career service um, services provided through our Workforce One centers, um, which is hugely important to us and I think comes to us at a really opportune time. Um, just as an agency and as a division, we are really looking to double down on our um, services for targeted populations to begin with. We think it's it's opportune, the market's ripe. Um, we understand that individuals need more supports um, and we're really working on that collectively. So this is again, a great time and a collaborative, collaborative experience for us to be able to do so. Um, we're going to support and expand partnerships and collaboration coordination really across New York City itself. So we have a really robust community partners program within workforce, um, meaning that our job is really to understand um, the landscape of community partners that exist within all across New York City. Because we understand in a lot of cases, um, 
it's not necessarily always the resources that are available that tend to um, pre um, prevent people from participation. It's really being able to navigate that. Um, so we really want to understand basic eligi eligibility criteria. We want to really assist individuals where they are. So if there's services that we don't provide specifically in Workforce One, we want to be able to provide the next best steps and really to partner with each other in terms of how do we best understand where that partnership begins. So it's really through conversations, really through understanding um, what support someone needs and really trying to build more um, inclusive communities to make sure that we're better serving this population. So again, we think this is going to be an opportune time to really um, develop that even further. Um, and then also to um, what's really important to us is that this is sustainable. So Chris took a little bit of my thunder. So the pilot has been extended from three years to five years, which is hugely important for us because as you know, this work is really hard and it's going to take time to get it off the ground and to make sure that it really works. And typically what happens a new initiative comes on board by the time we're, we're able to figure out somehow it gets the funding's no longer there. So we're really excited about this opportunity to have this expanded across five years to really get some lessons learned from everything that we do. And our goal is to really, like I said, integrate it into our service system. So it's not intended to be separate and apart. It's really, um, we're really trying to figure out ways to really increase increase our capacity and our understanding and our knowledge build across our system. Um, so again, that no matter what center you go into, you're getting the same um, quality of services. Um, and I think that there's an, an opportunity for us to continue to grow and learn upon that. Um, what I didn't say at the beginning, so this is a partnership. We are working really closely with the Mayor's Office of Talent and Workforce Development, of course, but also with the Mayor's Office um, with uh, people with disabilities. And over the last couple of months, um, um, we've really started um, on the ground in terms of really understanding each of our services, right? We've been operating, um, although we've been strong partners, we've been operating um, almost in the silos perhaps. Um, so it's really important for us in terms of being able to get it right for us to really understand operational approaches and then how do we better fit that in to one another. Um, our guess at this point that um, is that this pilot will occur in phases, meaning that it's going to probably look different um, in year three than it does in year one. Again, with the with the understanding that we're coming together with different philosophies, different ways of operating, and we're really trying to incorporate those ways to provide a service that's going to be best for the job seekers that are coming through our doors. Um, in terms of the supports that are going to be hired, we're going to we're looking to hire at the beginning um, three um, individuals that will really be um, spearheading this. But again, they're going to be um, the importance for us is that there's going to be support really across our system and our centers, um, and we really look to do this from not an, only in an operational approach, but also a true educational approach. So we will be providing training to all of our workforce one centers and staff members that exist within them. We're going to be providing additional training to our community partners that exist um, within our own network, and of course, we're going to be providing some additional trainings um, to our employers that are within high demand sectors. Um, um, again, we, we, the goal is to really increase capacity, understanding and knowledge um, to make sure that job connection um, is more successful for individuals <clears throat> with disabilities. And with that, I'll take any questions that you might have. Again, it's the very beginning of the pilot um, and I hope to show you much more, but if anyone has any questions, now's the time. Um, can you say a little bit more? Um, can you say a little bit more about um, occupations, or just again, like, like paint a more vivid picture of like a, an example, um, just to bring it to life a little bit more? Yeah. So. Um, and we're really kind of at the beginning phases in terms of conversation, in terms of where. Um, we think that specifically from an employer perspective, we can go because I think our understanding really is that employers just don't know and they don't know what they don't know in terms of better ways to really support individuals with disabilities. So I think we're starting from um, a perspective of just understanding what ways that we can inform that educational piece. Um, because as you know, it's, it's slightly different from I think what we do in terms of workforce one in terms of the advocacy piece. That's something that we think that'll be extremely important to this population. And we're really trying to figure out ways to implement that within our own sales. Um, so does it take the form of like drawing a sales pitch? Are we um, we're really having conversations and discussion discussing it? Are we having additional workshops or presentations that will better inform employers in terms of what it's like to better support the communities in general? Um, 
But in terms of occupations, I can talk a little bit about um, the way we've approached it in the past, specifically with our community partners. And it really comes down to because disabilities look very different in all forms in all communities. And it really, for us, really um, is dependent upon really um, two ends of the bargain. What really are the occupations that the job seekers are looking for or um, opportunities to connect? And then also, too, in terms of what the demand is and really trying to meet those needs in both ways. I think that's really the approach that we're going to take in general. Then. So I'm just curious about the timeline. Have you begun? Um, and where are you are? Yeah, in so right now we're in, we've been having conversations for about six months at this point in terms of the planning phase. We're actually at the point of, of the process where we're looking to hire or onboard these three positions. And then we have started having conversations with um, our centers in terms of understanding the integration, talking about uh, operations on our end. Um, as of next week, we're really going to be talking about operations from the MLPD side. Um, so again, very beginning phases of this, but um, we hope to have someone or individuals in place within the next two to three months to really get things off the ground in terms of implementation in the centers. Oh, and then what I did, so even without, sorry, one more thing and then <laughs> I'll hand it over. But even without the actual um, individuals or positions being filled, we're, we are starting um, the process of um, just starting to plan out our trainings too across our system within within our centers again, because we just see there's so much opportunity for our staff to grow and to develop in terms of really being able to better support. So that that work will start pretty immediately. Janine, we have a question from uh, Les. He has his hand up. Oh, up here. <laughs> uh, You're actually all around the room. Uh, yeah, so 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 as having family members with developmental disabilities, one of the big one of the big issues is is getting the message out to the people who need the programs, aside from the employers, which is is certainly a huge lift, um, but also uh, how how do people or is part of the the um, the mission to to increase the accessibility. You know, the idea of someone with dis uh, developmental disabilities just walking into a workforce one center is not going to happen unless they know that there's something there for them. Yeah, so that's uh, definitely a part of our overall mission goal. It's really increasing awareness and really being able to partner with our community partners really across New York City as well. So to your point, um, so MLPD already has a robust community partners program that they've already interacted with and, 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 and continue to engage and Workforce One does as well. We have about 350 community partners that we work with at any given time. So to your point, um, the goal is really to combine those efforts to ensure that we're really um, being very specific in engaging and can communicate a the changes that are being made and also to communicate the services that are available to individuals because to your point like no one just walks into a workforce one center and they're typically walking in because of something or because someone has directed them in that in that way um, and we're also just being um, mindful in terms of our just not only our, our partners but our communications in general Right. Um, in terms of some of our social media platforms that we're going to be looking at, really being able to highlight our services and our wins. Um, we think that um, having branded messengers is certainly going to play an impact in terms of highlighting the successes that we've seen. I'm talking about our dedication to that um, within our traditional publications as well. That'll be a continued um, communication piece. But the, the goal is really to ensure that people that ensure that there is an awareness of the services that we have available and to ensure that we're also connecting with people within the communities that can also serve as um, um, an engagement piece as well, because there's trust that's already built, been built up that we want to be able to certainly take advantage of. Thank you. One thing I would note um, that I think is important in this budget that the legislators uh, have been working on is actually increasing the income limits for people who are on Medicaid and like people with disabilities um, because folks have had to impoverish themselves in order to qualify for Medicaid and get home care services. And these same folks are very capable of being able to work in jobs and really contribute and um, be viable parts of the economy, but have been held out because of those income levels and stuff. So it's very promising that there's actually legislation to in expand um, the earnings for folks. Okay. 
Thank you, Janine. Thank you. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out at any point in time. Thank you. So now we're going to have a brief update um, on the youth WIOA programs and summer youth and the summer youth employment program. So I'm going to turn it over to Valerie, Deputy Commissioner for of Youth Workforce Connect at DCYD. Thank you. Uh, hi, everybody. Happy to be here representing DYCD. We are extremely busy. I think as Chris mentioned, the administration has had a tremendous focus on workforce and that is not. Am I doing that? You're doing that. OK, um, that is really trickled down to our team. Our charge is growing and growing and growing. And so I've brought two of my amazing directors here to talk to you a little bit about some of the things UICD is working on. Our charge is is large. Like I said, we oversee the WIOA youth programs and we also oversee the summer youth employment program, both of which are going through massive expansions, changes um, and you know innovation that we're working on at, at DYCD. So I'll turn it over to our director of strategy and integration, Zane Khan, to talk a little bit about what's happening in our WIOA programs. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I just want to give a brief update on what we're changing in our WIUA programs and by maybe just a level set, talk a little bit about what those programs are. So we receive the WIOA allocation for youth funds um, from, the, from the state uh, for New York City and it funds two programs. The first is Train and Earn and the second is Learn and Earn. Train and Earn is our out of school youth program and Learn and Earn is our in school youth program. Um, we've been moving in a direction that's trying to respond to some of the changes in the labor market um, because of the pandemic. And I think what we really learned from um, what's been happening for young adults who are out of school and out of work is that they were historically employed um, in industries that were sort of face to face. Um, some of that was in healthcare, some of that um, was in retail, hospitality, and they, over, they were overrepresented as a as a kind of like a demographic of that workforce. And so, what we wanted to do to address this is kind of move our programs to have more of a sectoral approach that would kind of um, make them more resilient to these changes in the labor market. So they had skills uh, training that was aligned to what employers are actually asking for now. So some of the major changes that we made to train and earn. Um, firstly, we are requiring any contractor to be sectorally focused on either media and entertainment infrastructure and infrastructure we're defining as how the federal government is giving their infrastructure funding through the bipartisan infrastructure legislation, um, healthcare. Um, and then tech. And so you essentially have to, as a contractor, align training, internships, um, your employer partners, all within that sector. And we are going to try to, it depends on how strong our proposal, proposals are, but we're going to try to really focus on getting at least one contract for each of these sectors. I think we'll see a lot more in infrastructure because of the, the, the funding that's going down from the federal government to the state. Um, but I think we really want to be ripe uh, for being able to access that funding by having more of our contractors focused on these um, on these sectors. Um, so what we really wanted to maybe beef up in these programs um, were the supportive services. So we changed our staffing pattern to add a mental health counselor, knowing that a lot of out of school, out of work young people need additional supports. Um, we added a service navigator because all of the WIOA programs have a year of follow up services. Um, and so we want to be really keenly focused on retention, um, on changing placement of that, you know, uh, if, if a job wasn't right for that young person. But we know that sometimes because you're managing multiple caseloads, that not all of the staff can really give attention to a participant when they exit the program. So we also beefed up our case managers. Um, we have two case managers now in the program. Um, and then we changed. Um, to having a full time job developer and an instructor or training liaison to. So the idea there is that we'll have a greater capacity to serve the young, the young adults in the program. Um, and then we're hoping to really shift to being just very focused on training. There won't be any more high school equivalency um, supports in the program because we want to focus more on doing referrals there so that the program is just focused on exactly what it's meant to do and knowing that that population of out of school, out of work young adults um, tend to be more educated now. Um, we have, a, I think, an 82% graduation rate um, out of the DOE, and so more people have their their diploma or equivalency. And there are other programs also, including in DOI City and in the DOE, that offer the HSE services. Um, 
we're trying to be more cohort based too. This is something that we learned from another program that we do for out of school, out of work young people called Advanced Intern. Um, I think the idea there is that we want to encourage more peer learning, more peer support and structured activities because there has been like significant um, learning loss, significant loss of socialization for some of these young adults. And because they're disconnected by nature, we want to encourage that they learn from each other and are part of something that's more rigid. Um, and then now moving to Learn and Earn. So Learn and Earn is our in-school youth program. It's very focused on being a college pathway program. Uh, it's for high school juniors um, and seniors, but we try to start with juniors so that they could be retained as a senior and really get a two year program. Uh, the idea that we want to really see that kind of changes how we've been doing this program is we are focusing on select schools rather than having just the contractors propose schools. We want to look at all of our investments as a city, both what we do at DUICD um, and what the DOE is also doing and think about supporting programs um, in schools that are very uh, under programmed and in historic neighborhoods that don't have high graduation rates and college enrollment rates. So we are going to release that concept paper um, for both train and earn and for learn and earn uh, in the next month. The RFP is going to be going out in fall. Programs will start, contracts will be awarded um, for, Jan for June, July 1st, 2024. Um, and I think what we're, you know, when we release the concept paper, um, Chris will share it with the Workforce Development Board. We hope to really get feedback um, and answer questions like in depth with you all and really make sure that the RFP reflects what you as board members, as employers are seeing too, um, so that we make sure that it's aligned to your partners, to your industries. Um, yeah, those are the main changes. Any questions? All right, thank you, Zane. And of course, if you all have questions about what he just talked about, please reach out to us. Uh, we're really excited about these concept papers. We've been working really, really hard on them and trying to move them forward. Zane's done an amazing job shepherding that through the, the process of what it is to do a big city RFP. So we're excited to put it out there and then to hear feedback from all of you. Um, and now to my other big favorite <laughs> initiative that the city has been hyper focused on the summer youth employment program which we are in the the middle of launching so becca would you like to come speak a little bit about where we're at there thanks good morning everyone can we go to the next I think two slides over next one next one great Thank you. So SYP, it's that time of year again. I know many of you probably are already aware that SYP is launched this year. I've seen grants emails go out. Thank you so much for that support grant. Um, so just overall program details, Summer Youth Employment Program supports young people ages 14 to 24 with the jump summer job experience. Um, for our 14 and 15 year olds, they're doing project based learning experiences with their providers. So what that looks like is um, a summer project based around career exploration, exploring different industries and what it's like to work in specific jobs. Um, and then for our 16 to 24 year olds, they're placed at an actual work site, getting maybe their first time job ever, or just continuing to explore what it's like to work in different industries. Participants are paid by the city for the six weeks that they work, $15 an hour. They can uh, work in two different cohorts. It's completely up to you whether starting July 5th or July 10th. Um, Thanks to Mayor Adams, we have an incredible investment um, supporting 100,000 jobs for summer youth employment um, that launched last year and we're continuing that charge this year. What I think is super um, interesting about this year is it's the 60th anniversary of SYEP. The program launched in 1963 under President Kennedy and it's New York City has been the really the only city that's been able to continue the program without any um, breaks in service for this entire time. Really special year. Um, we look forward to celebrating with all of you and our young people. Um, so if you're interested in getting involved in the 60th anniversary or you or someone you know worked in SYEP, what we're doing right now is capturing different stories of employer perspective, participant perspective of what it was like to work in the program through many different decades. Um, if you know someone who participated and they want to share their story, you can go on the DYCD website under SYEP and there's an area where you can share your story. SYUP is also launching um, different initiatives. So 
we have focusing on two this year. We have SYEP Pride, which is focusing on young people in the LGBTQ plus community um, and supporting them entryways into specific industries or careers and giving them and also our employers extra support to be able to support young people within this community. So what that looks like is we've partnered with the Mayor's Office of Community Affairs and um, NYC Unity Project, which is going to be doing um, provider trainings and employer trainings basic tics, tips and tricks and ways to support this community within the workplace. We're also focusing um, on equity and ramping up opportunities for young people with disabilities. So for example, last year, um, our partners at the NYPD hosted 40 young people who were deaf um, and hard of hearing. And this year they're gonna be focusing on young people um, who are blind. Mm -hmm. Other agencies are also focusing on ramping up initiatives. Just wanted to share an example of a larger agency that's really um, invested in supporting young people with disabilities. Can we go to the next slide, please? So just wanted to share some basic like what it looks like for a young person to go and work in SYEP. Many of this is like entry level jobs. If you have specific projects, maybe you don't have the capacity to handle, this would be a perfect opportunity for a young person to work um, with your company and do some type of project, be able to foster some new skills and opportunities for them um, to really get their feet wet in within your company organization, but also um, within the industry. Some of the employers we work with, I have um, listed here, we worked with over 18,000 different employers across the five boroughs last year um, and hoping to increase those numbers again this year. Next slide. So this was my favorite part um, and thanks to Mayor Adams, we have launched this enrichment series with SYEP. So last year we hosted 50 enrichment opportunities for young people to be able to explore careers and hear from professionals across different industries of what it's like to work in specific industries at their company and like what their career journeys looked like. So this is just a couple examples of what we did last year. Morgan Stanley hosted a networking career panel lunch and learn event for our young people. Mayor Adams actually hosted his very own enrichment at Gracie Mansion. He did a, a cooking demo for about 300 young people, followed by a celebrity chef career panel hosted by the Careers and Through Culinary Arts Program. Young people were able to go, um, and thanks to the EDC, on the New York, uh, New York City ferry tour. So they went to the ferry terminal, heard about different career pathways and how folks got their jobs there, and then went on like a unique tour um, of the harbor on the ferry. Go to the next one. And then another kind of cool opportunity, um, Governor's Island opened up their facilities for our young people to be get um, tours of the buildings, tours of what they do there, um, and then just have like a general overall fun day at Governor's Island. And then um, a fan favorite, our FDNY career day. Young people got to go to the FDNY training facility and see what it's like to be a firefighter for the day. They were putting out car fires, scaling five story buildings. It was a really incredible opportunity. Next slide. So how can you support? There are many different ways you can support the Summer Youth Employment Program. Um, in addition to hiring interns, we understand that, you know, we're back from COVID. Office life looks a little bit different now, and some folks maybe discontinued their internship program due to, you know, the ex uh, COVID and all of the things, but um, and they're lurking to, to ramp it back up. But in addition to that, um, in addition to hiring young people, you can host a career exploration event, you can host a career panel, you can design your own um, enrichment event and what you want that to look like. And of course, we're here to support you with whatever you wanna do. You can convene partners and your contractors, um, your professional network, just kind of spread the word about SYEP. Um, and then you can help us celebrate our 60th anniversary we're looking to maybe host some events here and there across the borough. So any space or just anything um, to support the 60th anniversary is appreciated. Next slide. Yeah, so questions um, have a few minutes. We're actually short on time. Okay, so I'm gonna no minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I can leave some of my cards. I'll leave some of my cards with Grant. If anyone is interested in SYEP, you want to host an event or do anything, feel free to get in touch with me. Thank you. Thank you. Grant. Okay, guys. I want to welcome the mayor. He's here. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. I got excited. 
Yeah. Well, no. Um, first off, thanks everyone for taking the time to fill my calls. I've been reaching out to a lot of board members, and we're really just trying to get the conversation going about how could we actually foster this relationship to get more slots. You know, like uh, Rebecca McDonough, she mentioned that employers actually have until May 26 to take SYP interns. You know, so we really just kind of want to uh, keep pushing that out. And everybody that's taking interns, we appreciate. We know last year you guys took some interns, but you know, it was very important for our city to move the city forward. You know, um, as uh, Rebecca was saying, work readiness training, project based learning, financial literacy training, summer jobs. This is an ecosystem that's going to continue growing because so many people come through SYEP. So um, just you know, keep the conversation going. If you have a cell number, I've been trying to reach some of you guys, and it's an office <laughs> number. So I know some of y'all ducking me. <laughs> Give me your cell phone number. I will call you personally. We can talk through some of these things. I talked to a few board members that mentioned they would be interested in actually being part of some of the kickoff events. If you want to be a part of a kickoff event or you want to partner, Give us a call, give us a, a email. Like I can connect you with Rebecca, I can connect you with Valerie, and that can happen. Um, last but not least, um, ask yourself, how many interns would you like to take this year? We need more interns. We need to kind of continue keeping it going. So, you know, talk to me after, after the meeting and we can continue the dialogue. But thank you and uh, see you later. <laughs> thank you, Grant. We're a fairly large board, right? I mean, I think we could, for the 60th anniversary, maybe come up with 60 touch points to SYEP. Can we do something? Yeah? <laughs> okay. Um, so now I am going to, uh, sorry, excuse me. As was mentioned earlier in Chris's report, right? Um, Mayor Adams signed the executive order, executive order 22 last year. One of the many things that that did was really um, was to create the Future of Workers Task Force. And one of the, the key areas, as we saw in the five that were listed there, was around apprenticeships. Um, so we will now hear from four individuals about the various aspects of the city's efforts to expand apprenticeships. So our own Chris Neal, Rachel Van Tosh from Accenture, Jessica Simonson from New York City Public Schools, Artist formerly known as DOE, I'm not saying anymore. Um, and Noel Parrish and Greg Mateo, both of whom are from CareerWise New York. And everybody's bios except for Chris's will be in the packet. <laughs> so I'm just going to give a really brief, seated introduction to these folks. Um, we already said this earlier, but you know, in the mayor's state of the city, the big moonshot goal was thirty thousand apprentices by the year 2030. We know there's a lot already in the skilled trades historically and some in manufacturing, but it requires really thinking creatively about how to grow apprenticeships. Uh, and part of it is understanding how many do we have right now and what is an apprenticeship, right? Um, because not all apprenticeships are necessarily registered with the New York State Department of Labor. Um, and so our office is working with Accenture uh, on a landscape analysis to try to figure out a number of things about the current state of apprenticeships in New York City. So we're gonna hear from uh, Rachel in just a minute, and then we'll hear about a specific program where the city is already investing heavily in apprenticeships with young people, with high school, with high school students. So high school students that will participate in three year apprenticeship programs, which is a really exciting and innovative initiative. So we're gonna hear from New York City Public Schools. And then as Audrey said, from uh, CareerWise New York, the, the nonprofit partner too public schools. So with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Rachel from Accenture to talk about the landscape analysis they're working on. Morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Can I push it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can everyone hear me now? Yes. yes. All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces and um, also be introduced to new folks. And I will say, as I was listening to the last presentation, I was texting um, my colleagues at Accenture mm -hmm. saying, do we host people? Or is there some way that we could be involved? So I can't promise, but we'll see if we could be one of the 60. <laughs> um, if you could go to the next slide. So I'm gonna take just a few minutes today, but then I'll be around for questions after if anybody wants to talk about the work that we're doing. I'm gonna start with introductions, give a, a quick project overview, and then depending on 
the time that we have, Chris, I can answer questions either now or at the end of everybody's presentations. Um, my name is Rachel Bantosh. I am a senior manager at Accenture in the public service team based in New York. I have worked in the world of economic development for many years prior to starting at Accenture. I worked um, for a like nonprofit mission driven financial services firm, but for about 10 years before that, I worked for the city, um, most recently at SBS. So this is a, an area that is near and dear to my heart. Um, and yeah, if we want to go to the, the next slide, as Chris mentioned, um, there has been a, a significant commitment, as all of you know, from the administration to think about how to expand apprenticeships, apprenticeships in New York City, but also um, even beyond what we think of as traditional apprenticeships. Um, what does it look, what is like a 21st century apprenticeship look like? What are some innovative earn and learn models that provide a real future path for individuals to like good jobs? And so that is what um, the mayor's office is aiming to expand and is what we are helping them think about in this landscape analysis. Like, yeah, you can go to the next slide. Perfect. So we are essentially working on a few different buckets of analysis in collaboration with the mayor's office. We are um, analyzing data in a whole bunch of different ways to look at, you know, what is the current landscape of apprenticeships in New York City, um, what types of occupations there are, and thinking about also what might be a set of priority occupations to further investigate for apprenticeship expansion. We are also conducting a lot of research through talking with individuals, um, just a selection of the folks that are, are being spoken with throughout this project are listed on the slide um, and thinking about, you know, things like what are the value propositions for apprenticeship for several different audiences, not for just employers, not for just apprenticeships, for, for the public, for our educational system. As Chris mentioned, we are doing some thinking and some work on what is really a threshold definition of apprenticeships. Uh, may not only be registered, but what does it mean if you go beyond that? And then finally, um, once we you know, pull together the data, pull together this research, we'll be offering a set of recommendations of short, medium and long-term actions that the city can take to help meet their goal. So we really see this as like a set of building blocks that the city can use to like take the next step, make an action plan and you know, hit and maybe surpass the 30,000 by 2030. Next slide. This is a relatively short project. We just started at the beginning of April. We'll be wrapping up before Memorial Day. So if you all are getting data requests or interview requests from us, thank you <laughs> for your quick response. Um, so we are, um, you know, get it. we're going to be delivering many different pieces to the city in this time frame. Um, right now, we are sort of in the current state of assessment, still talking to stakeholders, and we'll be continuing to do that for the next week or two. And then we'll start getting into some findings and recommendations work. Next slide. So how you could get involved. Um, I mean, very interested if you feel passionately about apprenticeships, you know, to, and we have not already spoken. I'm happy to set aside some time to do that before the end of this project, at the end of May or after, but it won't be included in the report. Um, but we are looking to speak directly with some apprentices and with employers, and we have, you know, started to to get folks. Um, signed up for different sessions with us. Um, we're aiming to have sessions sort of the beginning, middle of May. So if there are apprentices that you know, if there are employers who've hosted apprentices who'd like to share about their experience, good or bad, we would love to hear from you. Um, and we're looking for all different sectors, all different ages for apprentices. We're gonna have one workshop with youth, youth apprentices specifically and one with adults. Um, so. You, know, you can find me right after this. I can share my contact information if it's not already shared out. And um, we would really welcome 
your help in identifying folks to speak with. Next slide. Chris, do I have time for questions now? OK, no. We're All right. Until the end from everybody. Happy Once to take questions at the end. <laughs> okay, our next presenter. Hi, everyone. Okay. Jessica Simonson, I'm senior director of the Career Readiness and Modern Youth Apprenticeship Initiative at the New York City Public Schools. Um, and so I'm, I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with the initiative, it's a three year pilot program. And so I wanna just build a little bit on what Chris may have introduced earlier in the session. Um, the pilot was launched back in, I believe June of last year. I came on board in October. And so it's been a really quick ramp up. There are 58 schools selected to participate and the Career Readiness Modern Youth Apprenticeship Initiative, I always say it has these two arms to it, right? There's the career readiness side, and then there's the modern youth apprenticeship side. And everybody, you know, we, we talk about the apprenticeships because it's so exciting and it's so innovative and, and really shiny and new. But the career readiness side is, is a really important foundational component of the pilot. So it is a three-year pilot, and in these 58 schools, students will receive, ninth and 10th grade students will receive um, three separate career readiness curricula. Um, in ninth grade, they receive a curriculum called um, career exploration. And the intention is that that is universally delivered to all ninth graders. In 10th grade, they have a curriculum called career development. Again, the intention is that it's universally delivered to all 10th graders. And then second semester, 10th grade, students participate who are interested in participating and committing to a three-year apprenticeship, participate in a course called Pathway Matching, where they go through the actual application process where they can apply for an apprenticeship. And this is a partnership with our friends at CareerWise. And we'll talk a little bit more about the nuances of, of the apprenticeship and uh, program in itself. But the really important part is that these students who are eventually selected for apprenticeships, <laughs> have this foundational understanding and this foundation of career exploration and career development upon which to kind of launch their apprenticeship. So they're coming to employers um, ready to work with some sort of foundational understanding about what it means to embark upon a career and really make this commitment to um, as an apprentice. Um, you can go to the next one. So we we speak to our employer partners, um, many of which this year for the first time are New York City agencies. Um, and we speak to them as though this is not a corporate social responsibility uh, initiative. This is, yes, it's something amazing for the students in New York City public schools, but you know, whether or not equally as important is that it's a really great talent pipeline for employers and it is it is not an employer doing something nice to host a student and have this learning opportunity but this is a way for employers to develop their staff and develop their workforce for years to come so the the hope is that students at their end of their three-year apprenticeship will go on to secure a full-time employment with their host agency or employer you can go to the next slide. So this may be a terminology that everyone in this room is familiar with, but just want to really highlight as this is the conversation we have with a lot of employers and city agencies as we talk about hosting apprentices. What is the difference between an intern, as we heard from SYEP earlier, and an apprentice? Um, obviously, an apprentice is a much deeper um, commitment. So in for the CRMYA initiative, which is a mouthful, right? Career Readiness Modern Youth Apprenticeship. Um, it is a three-year commitment by both the student and the employer. Um, there is, this is, they are serving in occupationally specific titles. So they're not going in to find out about what it's like to be in an office or get some time, you know, developing relationships or networking. They're going in in a specific occupational title to learn a skill. And we typically think of, of apprenticeships as in trades. But we're really thinking about this primarily for CRMYA in business finance and IT. 
and thinking about how are these students or these apprentices at the end of their three years prepared with a uh, on the job training to say, I am a junior coder, right? Like I have this experience, this apprenticeship under my belt, and now I have, can put that on my resume with specific skills and projects that I worked on. Um, and so it is a, a far deeper, more intensive experience than, a, than an internship, which is valuable in its own right, but different than an apprenticeship. And you can go to the next. So some, some basics that we share with our employers, the students begin their apprenticeship with employers in their 11th grade year. Um, things look a little different when we're talking about transfer schools. We understand that every school is a little bit different, but this is the, the typical model that that's, um, has been created. They begin their first year of their apprentice uh, apprenticeship in, in 11th grade, um, then second year in 12th grade, and there is a third year, assuming a year 13 for a student. That year 13, as Noel always speaks about, is you know an options multiplier. And so this is a time when a student can work part-time, go to college part-time, maybe take a gap year, maybe say, hey, two years was good, I'm where I want to be, and I'm going to go to school full-time, or however they want to continue that relationship. But the we expect that employers and apprentices are going in with a three-year commitment. Um, we ask employers to take on a cohort of, of apprentices. We want them to have each other, to support one another, to have some sort of community. It, it can be a really daunting experience going in as a 16-year-old as a into a corporation or into a city agency all by yourself. And so so we do ask that that employers bring on a cohort of, you know, at least three apprentices. Um, doesn't have to be in the same office, doesn't have to be under the same supervisor, but they know that they have each other in the space. Um, and the hourly wage is determined and paid for by the employer. And there is a, um, and, and Greg, I believe, will talk a little bit more about the on-the-job on and credentialing process with the New York State Department of Labor. And you can keep going. So this speaks a little bit to the coursework that comes prior to the apprenticeship opportunity. Um, you can keep going. I know we're time is of the essence here. I want to make sure we touch on all the big stuff. OK, great. Uh, with that, I will pass it over to CareerWise to talk more about the apprenticeship initiative in itself. Thank you, Jessica. Um, again, my name is Noel Parrish. I'm Chief Innovation Officer at CareerWise New York and work really closely um, with Jessica and NY, uh, NYCPS. Um, so the mission of CareerWise New York, we are a 501c3 nonprofit um, that was incubated by an organization, a nonprofit in the Bronx called Here to Here in 2019. Um, and that we've been going strong since then. We've already placed about 500 students in these three-year apprenticeships in companies like Amazon Accenture and JP Morgan Chase. Um, our mission is to really build a system um, that supports modern youth apprenticeship. So some of the jobs that you heard uh, Jessica talking about, um, you know, IT, um, business and finance, and then we're also moving into hospitality and healthcare um, in occupations like junior coder, graphic design, you know, human resources associate, et cetera. Um, part of our work with the Career Readiness uh, Modern Youth Apprenticeship Pilot is to support the curriculum that Jessica was talking about. So we have the three curricula that sort of act as front-loaded training in a pipeline um, from the 58 schools that are part of the initiative. And then there's also three entry points into the apprenticeship. So we recruit in business, IT, and um, finance directly from that 10th grade um, the in the spring semester. And then students get some training over the summer, and then they start their apprenticeship in 11th grade. We're also recruiting um, in the fall of 11th grade into hospitality, into occupations like event planning or retail hospitality. And then we'll, we're also um, working with the five largest hospital systems in New York City now to launch a healthcare pathway that will uh, recruit in the fall of the 12th grade and then do some of the um, pre-apprenticeship work required to get a certification that allows students to start an entry-level position and then partnering with the New York's um, Job CEO Council to move them into a, a next-level role in things like, you know, RNA, um, LPN, um, radiology assistant, et cetera. So um, in addition to that, we work 
closely with our employer partners to support the students as apprentices, and Greg will talk more about that. Um, and then we also make sure that um, students are well prepared. Go to the next slide. Um, so some of the things we do, like I said, are the curriculum in ninth and 10th grade. Um, we also have a team of project managers that works directly with the schools and supports them instructionally. We provide coaching and training to the teachers in the schools. And then in year two of the pilot, we're working with New York City Public Schools to hire school design coaches to work with principals to help integrate um, these three curricula and the three entry points into the whole school model. Um, so they'll be part of the school culture and part of the whole school programmatic structure. Um, we also offer uh, a hiring hub that helps match students to the opportunities. So after they've been studying, they've done three semesters work worth of thinking about who they are, what they're interested in and what's available to them, and then what's expected of them, they start to actually choose a pathway. And so that's when we begin to match the student to the individual companies and the different occupations within those companies. We use some algorithm within our hiring hub to do that. Um, we also make sure that we have our project managers working directly with the um, CSMs who support our employers to get good matches. Uh, and then we also um, make sure that we have, you know, student friendly job descriptions as well as student friendly interview uh, questions. And we work with companies directly on how to interview young people. Um, and then through the apprenticeship, students are able to earn college credit and credentials. So I'm going to pass it over to Greg Mateo now to talk about that. Next slide, please. Uh, good morning, Greg Mateo here, also with CareerWise New York. Um, so I'm going to briefly touch on college credit uh, and, and why we focus on this, right? So one is the reality. We, we saw relatively quickly that most of our apprentices were college minded and were going to college anyway, um, and that had some implications onto that third year. So we wanted to create an uh, options multiplier. We want to ensure that they stood with the program, but as they decided to go into college, we, we create an accelerated path to graduation. Um, so we partner with New York, um, New York CEO Job Council, um, who has connected us with many of the CUNY campuses, um, currently only CUNY SVS School of Professional Studies and Lehman College um, have agreed to partner with us. And we've developed an assessment that would ultimately award 12 credits for their apprenticeship. And here's the breakdown of essentially how they would do it um, based on our program elements, right? So one is three credits for the career development, for Maya, um, they would offer upon successful completion. They would also offer three credits for the career uh, ready competency. So each of the uh, apprentices get evaluated on career ready competencies that we develop. And then three additional credits on occupational competencies, which we also develop. And then finally, three credits for the apprenticeship in itself, right? So 12 credits in total would be awarded simply for an apprentice going through and completing the apprenticeship. Uh, and currently, again, this is with CUNY SPS uh, and Lehman College. Um, moving down, and I see Angie's here. Um, so we're, we're also partnering with, with NYU SPS, and they're taking a, a slightly different approach to creating, you know, having the credit equivalencies. Um, and part of why we, we are partnering with NYU SPS is the reality is not everyone is going to CUNY, right? Um, and, and we realized that they're, like I mentioned earlier, they're really college minded students and they they want some selected college options, right? But a lot of these college options tend to be out of state or upstate um, and they leave in droves, um, which then, you know, has implications on that third year and inability to complete, you know, so we, we have partnered with NYU SPS. Um, we're currently in the midst of developing a curriculum that would award up to 12 core credits um, in IT and, and business ops. The difference between, and I'm being really <laughs> abbreviated here because of time, um, the, the CUNY options are bachelor's degree um, and then NYU SPS is an applied associate's degree, right? So going back to uh, a comment someone made earlier about options multiplier, I think, you know, we, we need to cast a wide net 
to be able to, you know, bring in and ensure that as many apprentices are staying with their apprenticeship, but also see college as, as an option uh, for them. Um, so that's briefly uh, on the college uh, credit component. And then I'm going to move on to how we support the employers, right, which is a, a question uh, Chris asked us to uh, speak to. So on, on the engagement column, you'll see we do site visits, mock interviews, uh, recruitment events with schools, um, and so on. Uh, we create sector-based approaches to pathway creation. In other, other words, you know, if, if an employer wants to um, hire an apprentice in an occupation that we currently don't have, we work with them to develop that occupation so we can stand it up and they can ultimately hire an apprentice. Um, so, you know, one relatively hot and recent is like cybersecurity. Hospitality is something that's coming down the pipe, as Noel noted, and, and healthcare as well, right? These are some new occupations we did not have in the first three years of our, our uh, apprenticeship. Um, we convene community practice so employers can talk to each other about some of the best practices um, that they're facilitating within their own companies, and perhaps you know someone can replicate. Um, and then we also have a youth apprenticeship advisory board. Uh, that's been critical and championing uh, youth apprenticeship uh, within their respective companies. How we further support, you know, employers, uh, each employer is assigned a, a client success manager and that client success manager is dedicated to that account. They meet with that account on a weekly basis, whether that's with the program lead who manages the program internally for the company, um, they also conduct post checks with, with supervisors and apprentices to gauge how things are going, find where, where there may be skill gaps and, and, and support them in developing training plans and so on. Um, there's also a senior case manager um, similar to uh, you know, the approach that the YCD recognized, I think we're recognizing too, is that you know, these young people are coming to us with lives, right? And, and those lives are, are not sort of linear uh, and we need to figure out ways to support them beyond just what happens in the workplace. Um, so that senior case manager will sort of really look at things beyond how they're performing in their job. Uh, so I think that's an immensely critical role for us and we're hiring. So if you know anyone who, with a case social work background is interested in workforce development, send them our way. Uh, and then finally, you know, we, we facilitate um, training, whether that's synchronous um, on a quarterly basis or asynchronous, we create um, short videos uh, based on needs and employer feedback on, on things they need um, and sort of, you know, dispense it across the network um, so employers can, can sort of disseminate um, internally to their supervisors who may not always be available to attend a synchronous uh, training. Um, and then we also provide quarterly training for apprentices outside of, of what Noel noted. We, we do some front loaded training right before they start, but we continue that training throughout the, the year. And if they're registered apprentice on the Department of Labor, then they have additional training that, that happens as well. But those are more occupation specific, whereas our quarterly training tends to be more soft skills oriented. Um, and, and that's what we have. Thank you. Thank you all for the presentation. Yes, you want to open it up for Q and A. Les has a hand up. Yeah, thanks, Adrian. I, I was looking at, at just doing some quick math on the hours required, especially for high school students. You know, I saw 12, 24, certain number of hours per week. How, how is this, how does this mesh with, you know, the, uh, the required curriculum hours? I mean, I um, mean, these are, are, is this happening? Is this overlapping? Is it in addition to? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what it typically looks like is that students go to school in the morning and then they leave at about noon to travel to their uh, company and they work Monday through Thursday from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. And so what we've also been able to do is some of our summer training that leads into the program 
is actually taught by um, licensed teachers and is worth uh, high school credit. And so students are able to front load some credits, remove a class from their schedule, and then spend the second part of the day learning um, at work where they can get uh, be working on their college credits while getting paid um, while completing high school on time. So it's again to that options multiplier point, um, really stacking the deck in favor of the students so they can accomplish many different goals at once, um, all while making uh, anywhere between 15 to $25 an hour. I, 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 I laud the, the, the goal and, and I'm just, I'm, I just question or concern, you know, about, you know, a, a student's capabil, uh, capabilities of getting everything in, in in a given day, especially if you're reducing the hours in the, you know, the standard curriculum. Yeah, you know, Les, I, I can actually speak to it from the from the principal side. So we are working with school leaders to ensure that they are scheduling courses so that students can make sure that they have all of their required graduation courses in the mornings when they are in in, sc in the school building. Um, it does take some creative scheduling on part of principals. Principals really um, have to be very thoughtful, not just how they schedule for that that one student or those three students who are from their school who have apprenticeships, but for all of their students, right? We had one principal say, well, we have a um, like a rotating schedule so for their whole school. So one day you know, on Monday period one might be first, but on Tuesday period one might be second. And having that rotating schedule is what works best for the whole school, but not for these few students that had apprenticeships. And so principals are doing the work and we're, you know, as New York City Public Schools, we're guiding them through this to ensure that students have all the required coursework that they need. It is hard, it is taxing. Students are on the go from early in the morning, they get home late, just like, you know, it's, it is a full day for them. Um, we're also providing principals with guidance this year in um, because principals can decide whether or not they want to offer high school credit for these apprenticeships. So that may also be a way for students to continue to accrue credits while they're participating in their apprenticeships. Thank you. I see Sandy has a question also. Hi. This is more of a general uh, question about the general approach, not for this particular description. Should I hold on that, Andrea? No, go ahead. No, no. OK, so I, I love in this this youth apprenticeship model. I love the rigor of it, that that, that it's a paid engagement, um, that it's for credit, uh, that it's a, you know, a, a deep approach to apprenticeship. One of the things that was said, I think by Chris early on, I don't know if it was Chris or Accenture, but early on is there is that there's a, a, a moment of trying to define apprenticeships. And I'm wondering why we're not using the registered apprenticeship as the model, which has particular uh, requirements around things like wage progression, employment at the end of it. There is a, there's some concern about confusing work-based learning projects, which are very good and, and important in their own right with apprenticeships and therefore weakening what an apprenticeship is. And so I guess the question is really maybe more towards the board around when we say we're trying to figure out how we define apprenticeships, can we use the registered apprenticeship as the definition? Or if we're not going to use the registered apprenticeship definition, how are we going about defining it to make sure that some of those important quality measures are maintained? Uh, this is Chris. I'll, I'll take the first stab at responding. It's a great question, Sandy. I think we definitely, at least in the Mayor's Office of Talent and Workforce Development, view registered apprenticeship as the gold standard. But as you also suggested, you know, there, there can be rigorous models that, you know, could reasonably be considered an apprenticeship but aren't yet registered. And so that is one of the things that we're working on with Accenture is to figure out, like, and with the Future of Workers Task Force, 
recommendations, you know, we, we're not looking at just a regular internship, right? It's a lot more than that. There ha it has to have certain very clear cut standards. So um, we don't have those, uh, the, that threshold definition yet. Um, and we certainly welcome your input and the input from other members of the board. I don't know if Rachel, you have anything to add to that. No, Chris, I think you captured it. It's certainly still in development, but um, you've raised very good points, Sandy. And you know, those are the exact types of things that we're thinking of how to um, think about this in a way that doesn't delude apprenticeships. Like, for example, Accenture's apprenticeship program would I think otherwise be registrable, but we haven't registered it yet with the Department of Labor. Um, so we don't want to preclude participation in programs like that as part of our, our holistic thinking. I think that's true of a lot of sort of non-traditional apprenticeships, although maybe career-wise could add more on that. Yeah, really quickly, uh, we are petitioning uh, or have a, a set recommendations to the Department of Labor. One of the issues, as many of you know, um, apprenticeship is a pretty old um, sort of pipeline initiative. And, and they have no definition of youth apprenticeship. So we're trying to help them shape what that is because it, it is slightly different, right? So we talked earlier around, you know, uh, our apprentices work 12 to 16 hours in the, in the first year. A traditional apprenticeship, they're working 40 hours a, a, a week per year, right? So they're reaching a thousand hours. Um, at the end of one year, our apprentices don't reach a thousand hours until you know year one and a half, right? So, sh helping them redefine what youth apprenticeship is and looks like, um, whether that's just you know redefining uh, New York State minor labor laws that would allow an, a youth apprentice to work more than four hours on a day, um, looking at graduation requirements. There's a host of things that I think are baked into our efforts to to really redefine it without sort of diluting, you know, registered apprenticeship. Uh, and, and that's, you know, what we're doing in earnest here in New York State, but also nationally. Great, can I just underscore that point? I think, I mean, is it fair to say that career-wise and NYC public schools are trying to make sure that either all or most of the young people participating in the youth apprenticeship program, that they're participating in a an apprenticeship program that is registered. Yes. Right. The so, goal is to have the, all of those be registered. I think it's a work in progress because you're growing very quickly, um, but the intent is at least for this program to have them all be in registered apprenticeship, right? Yes. Um, so cohort five, which is where we're currently recruiting, um, we will have most registered. Um, and cohort six, any employer who decides to join us would have to participate in the registered apprenticeship program. That would be non-negotiable, right? So that, that that is our path. We recognize that again, registered apprenticeship is the gold standard, and that's the route we're taking. Yep. Um, Rachel, I under if I. Thank, thank you. Hi, my name is Sharice Davis and I'm from um, Access VR, a New York State agency that helps individuals with disabilities obtain employment if, and advance in their career. Um, if I understood correctly, you're working with 500 schools and I would just like to know how the schools were selected and if any of the schools um, are in District 75, which serves in, uh, students with disabilities. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, there are actually, there are 58 schools um, and we, the goal is to have 500 apprentices at the end of year one. So 58 schools, there was an application process last summer where I believe, again, like I wasn't on board at this time, but I want to say over a hundred schools applied to be part of the CRMYA pilot. Um, of them, 58 were selected. One is a district 75 school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a good question. I'll just add to that too. We have a full-time FT, um, director at CareerWise, whose main job it is, is to figure out how to work with programs like Access VR and with different populations of students to get them access to the registered youth apprentice. Great. Um, 
This was really interesting and I can imagine we will have more conversations and this will continue since it's such a large part of the future of workers task force uh, or, and the city's objectives. So uh, look forward to continuing conversations and seeing what role we play as a board in all of this. Um, so we're going to get ready to close. I want everyone to note that our next board meeting will take place in person unless you have a law abiding reason to be <laughs> on screen. Um, it will be June 7th from 9 to 11 back here. Uh, a reminder for the folks we need uh, disclosures for, please get those in. And finally, connect with Grant so that we can try to hit that 60 something number uh, in terms of summer youth employment and, and celebrate. Um, I think that is it. It has been great to see everyone in person. So nice to be here. And I will take a motion to adjourn the meeting. Thank you. And, a, and I saw a second, Ileana. <laughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, so uh, yes, uh, my